This lane is reserved for bicycles and scooters, but maybe not for long. That's this week on Motoring 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. Last week we arrived in Shanghai, China to check out the Michelin Challenge Babendum, the world-leading clean car technology forum held at the brand new Formula One circuit just outside of Shanghai. This is the sixth year of the event and the first time in China. And in some ways, China exemplifies the key challenges facing this planet in the coming years with energy demands and urban pollution. You know, eight of the most polluted cities in the world are found right here in China. And you know, the challenge of Bendem brings those involved in the auto industry from around the world, not so much to find a solution, but rather to highlight the work that is being done to find the ultimate clean car. And you know, last year alone, over 200,000 Chinese got off their bikes and behind the wheel. They are simply car crazy. And you know, this is the first time the Chinese will get a first-hand look at what many hope will be the automobiles of the future. The people of China want to drive. Uh, are they concerned about pollution? Yes, they are concerned about pollution. They need the green energy and they need a blue sky because you know in big cities you cannot see a blue sky, you see a grey sky. So everybody said now we have money and we have everything but we don't have blue sky, we don't have clean air, we need them. So I think we can meet their requirements by the green vehicles. This is a great thing. It's great to get out and really show people what technology can actually do in actual cars. Um, what's good about this is they do the whole range. It's not just fuel cell vehicles. It's not just natural gas or alternative fuel vehicles. It's everything. So people can really look at the range of options that are going on around the world for efficient and clean transportation. When you drive around here, you, you certainly can see and, uh, and smell and feel um, the quality of the air is not what we're used to back in, uh, in Canada um, and presumably what they want in California either. So, uh, I mean, you're coming right through the middle of the place where, where perhaps it's the, it's the most needed uh, in, in emerging uh, economies like China. The Chinese at a record pace are so excited about driving cars. Um, do they care enough about the environment, if you know what I mean? It's a good question. Um, certainly, if we, if we look at the skies we're seeing here today, one would say the answer is no. And yet what we're hearing is that they've instituted a lot of programs over the last three or four years to help, or at least to start cleaning things up. And uh, it does seem as if directionally they're going in the right direction. Whether it's fast enough to be effective may be another question. Do young people understand this in China? I think not only the young people, I think uh, everybody knows that environment protection is very important. Otherwise, we will pay more for the development or for the protection of it if we don't do some things, uh, say, in advance. How I just I judge success of Challenge Bimandam? First, the feeling of achievement among participants of sharing experience, of learning, uh, and I think it is, it is the key because this is a forum, this is a platform, we say rallying together towards sustainable mobility. The fact they unite together and where we try to be their host in order to, uh, to push forward some of these solutions is for me the first sign of success. A lot of people now have cars 
and they need oil, you see. But we lack the oil in the world. You see, the, the price of the oil is higher and higher every day. So we need another, say, green bus, for example, electric bus, to relieve the, the pressure of the oil. And so we, we produce such kind of a lithium battery to meet the requirements of electric vehicles. I'm optimistic in that at least they're talking about it. There's, a, there's an awareness that, that this is a serious issue. And everyone seems very certain that in the next uh, 20 to 30 years, there really, really is going to be a serious problem with the availability of uh, petroleum to, to fuel uh, products into the future. So whether you like it or not, uh, you're going to have to get on board with a technology that's, uh, that's not going to need uh, fossil fuels. The pollution is now is very serious now. And say even the, the water, the air, and all the, the noise, they are all it's, it's polluted very much. And the government now they want to take the steps to improve the environment. And I, I say I will do something to cooperate with the government to make a, a better, clean environment. We know the technology there, but as the bottom line is, is that we as consumers have to buy into it. And we have to buy into it, and uh, the manufacturers and, and the governments also have to buy into it. It's, it's, it's everybody's uh, involvement. We're all in it together. Do you see anything different about this big V8 engine? No? Well, that's pretty much the point. More later on Kenzie's Corner. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the latest version of the Honda Accord. Now, this is no ordinary Accord, and for two very important reasons. First of all, it's a hybrid. But second, and more importantly, it takes hybrid technology to a place it's never been before. The Accord Hybrid takes the lessons Honda learned in the odd Insight and more mainstream Civic and builds a better mousetrap. As before, an electric motor is sandwiched between the engine and transmission. Now, depending upon the demand, the Accord is either powered by the engine alone or the engine is helped by the electric motor. The latter also reverses its function to charge the main battery, which eliminates the need to plug it in to keep the battery topped up. You know, hybrids have become famous for delivering fabulous fuel economy, and this Accord is no exception. Around town, well, it sips its fuel at 7.9 litres per 100 kilometres, and that number drops to 5.9 when you're out on the highway. During the test, well, I got an average of around about 7 litres per 100 kilometres. To put that into perspective, you've got a mid-size sedan with a V6 engine that delivers the fuel economy of a four-cylinder Honda Civic. Talk about having your cake and eating it too. As with other hybrids, whenever the Accord comes to a stop, the engine shuts down and only fires back to life when the driver lifts off the brake pedal. It also uses electricity to power the steering and air conditioning, as well as improved aerodynamics in the economy cores. It also shuts down three of the six cylinders whenever the demand for power is low. The clever part is that if the demand only rises slightly, rather than firing up the dead cylinders, the system brings the electric motor online to cover the shortfall. Now this action keeps the gasoline side at its frugal best. When you compare the hybrid to a regular Accord, the differences are very subtle indeed. Primarily a couple of gauges on the dash. They tell you whether the electric motor is charging the battery or driving the vehicle. The other place you'll find the difference is right here in the trunk. There's no split folding rear seat because that's where the main battery sits. The saving grace, the trunk will already hold about 12 cubic feet of stuff, so it's a very small sacrifice. The reason for the Accord's alacrity is down to the gas-electric combination and the 255 horsepower and 232 pounds-feet of torque it produces, which is an increase of 15 and 20 respectively when compared to the regular V6 Accord. The beauty of the design is as the electric motor develops most of its torque at very low revs, it pushes the car off the line with more authority and then maintains this work ethic until the engine comes fully on cam. In both cases, the 5-speed automatic helps the cause. 
It has a low first gear which is good for pulling off the line and a tall top gear which eases the engine's load on the highway. Where the Accord Hybrid differs from most other hybrids is the fact that it not only places an emphasis on fuel economy, it puts an equal emphasis on performance. Try 255 horsepower, a 0 to 100 km an hour time of about 7.5 seconds, and it'll bridge the 80 to 120 km an hour gap in 6.1 seconds. The bottom line, this is one seriously quick sedan. The hybrid also earns active noise control. Here the system listens to the interior noises and then plays an equal but out of phase noise back through the speakers which effectively cancels most of the din. In terms of ride comfort and handling, the extra mass added by all the various hybrid bits and pieces has very little effect. Large bumps are swallowed in stride and it ran the pylon test as well as any other Accord. Even when the pavement breaks up mid-corner, the suspension keeps its cool, allowing the car to follow the driver's intended line. Ditto the anti-lock brakes as they provided sure-footed stops. This new Honda Accord is a truly wonderful tool, and for more than just the fact that it delivers a ton of performance with extraordinary fuel economy. The bottom line, this thing incorporates the hybrid technology into a car so seamlessly the driver remains unaware that it's actually doing its thing. And that, you know, is the hallmark of truly sound engineering. Our Midas tip of the week concerns preparing your vehicle for winter driving. What you have to do to winter prep your vehicle can vary tremendously depending on the age and mileage of the vehicle. If you've got a real late model car with low mileage, you may need nothing more than an oil change with the appropriate grade of winter oil. If your car is high mileage and hasn't had a lot of service recently, you could need some major preparation to get ready for winter. One thing to keep in mind about late model low mileage cars is some of them come on high performance low profile tires. So even though the tread depth is still there in your tires, they may not be appropriate tires for Canadian winter. Talk to your service personnel to make sure you've got good tires that are appropriate for the winter and you've checked the inflation pressure. But no matter what you do in your car, you should also have a winter preparedness package in your car. You can buy a prepackaged one like this one. It's got a blanket in it a first aid kit, booster cables and tow ropes, etc. This is a real good thing to keep with your vehicle, makes a great gift as well. Or you can put one together yourself as this motorist has done. It's got a compressor in it, a blanket, ice scraper and some other accessories as well. Consult your local Motor League or Auto Club about what should comprise your winter survival kit. And remember, no matter how well your vehicle is prepared mechanically, you could still run out of fuel or have a tire blow. And if it's rough weather, you've got to make sure you're properly dressed and you've got things like the car blanket, water, and high energy snack foods in the vehicle. That's your Midas tip of the week. The way this event has, has progressed over the years is pretty amazing. In the, uh, in the beginning, when there was a relatively small number of us uh, and small number of manufacturers, relatively, uh, we'd all get together, thrash the cars around on the track and on the roads and uh, get together afterwards, have a few beers, talk it all out, pick some winners. Um, today the program has become, uh, the process has become much more formalized, more scientific if you like. Uh, the evaluations are more accurate, they're, they're more detailed, they're more demanding on the journalists and I think on the vehicles themselves. What we're dealing with here uh, in 2000, for the 2005 model year are 62 total entries of which we have probably two or three copies of each car, a uh, total of about 12 million dollars worth of vehicles. Uh, each of the cars gets driven by uh, on individual road tests and uh, in what we call team evaluations where it's a much more intensive process. The biggest thing that makes our test fest unique here in Canada is, is that we ask that all the drivers test the same vehicles over the same roads on the same day. 
Other awards, they'll let you drive cars six months apart. And I'm sorry, I have a good seat of the pants, but it's not that educated and it doesn't have that good a memory that I can tell one car from another six to eight months apart. When you put them like we do, same day, same course, it's much, much better. You know, one thing you learn about the rules of the road here in Shanghai is that there are no rules. And while I wouldn't want to be driving here, just standing at an intersection is entertainment itself. And you know, this is my first trip to Asia and I was really looking forward to eating the food and I have no regrets, but I do have one big disappointment. I was talking to one of the young translators here from Shanghai the other day, asked her where she was having dinner and she said, McDonald's. Then out at the challenge, but Ben, then what were the young people eating? KFC. Now, hey, I got nothing against the Colonel, but I'll take Shanghai noodles any day. All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Brad, interesting job came in the other day. This 98 RAV4 came in basically for winterizing. And I've worked in this car for quite some time, basically since it was new, on and off. But I usually only see it when there's a problem with it. So it might be, you know, do a front brake job and an oil change, do a battery and an oil change. Uh, there's quite a bit of writing under the hood of this car where I've serviced it previously, changed the transmission fluid in 2003, front brake job in 2002. But since July of 03, it hasn't really needed any mechanical service. And I thought, you know, hadn't heard from the customer in quite some time, they were probably taking it somewhere else for the minor maintenance, the oil changes, fluids, filters, etc. Phone rang the other day and this car came in, looked at it. It hadn't been serviced anywhere else since I'd looked at it. July 30th of 03. Since then, 14 months had gone by and 23,000 K without an oil change. Drained all the oil out of it and poured it into a container to measure it and it had just over one liter of oil in the engine. It's a wonder this engine didn't seize up. And of course it was blacker than ink, fully contaminated, totally used up. It's a wonder this engine didn't sustain some damage, but as far as we can see, it seems to be running fine now after just an oil change and some minor servicing. But don't push your luck on your car. You don't want to find out the hard way that you can only push your luck so far. Now, if you have the TV on late at night, you'll see infomercials where they drain all the oil out of an engine, pour back one liter of oil, and then drive the car in a racetrack with their miraculous additive, and it doesn't seize up. Well, I got news for you, boys. All engines pick up oil from the bottom of the pan, so they'll run with one liter of oil. But that one liter of oil that's in there will be grossly overheated and grossly contaminated because you're trying to dissolve all the heat from inside that engine and all the contaminants that get into that motor oil into only one liter of oil. So it won't last for long, but you can get away with it for a while. Don't try it with your car because there will be some long-term price to be paid. You can be sure of that. Now, I'm in the habit of writing on the oil filter with a paint marker every time I put it on. So when I look at a car that I've worked on previously, I know how long it's been without going to stickers, without going to the computer, or going to invoices previously done on that car to find out. I can look and find out in a hurry, and that's something that I really believe in. But in any case, make sure that even if you push your luck on oil changes and go a few thousand K past the interval, at the very least, you've checked the oil level and filled it up. If it's down oil, top it up. Even if you're going to change it tomorrow or next week, top it up so you don't run the risk of damaging that engine. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2005. For more information on past and future episodes of Motoring, log on to the Motoring website at motoringtv.com where you can email your suggestions, questions, and comments, which are always welcome. That's motoringtv.com. Hybrids are all the rage these days. You see all the Hollywood stars driving around in the little Toyota Priuses thinking they're saving the world. These people can buy their own refineries. What do they care? But you know, with the Prius and the various Honda Civics, they're all really cool and they work really well. But they're already working on vehicles that already get really good fuel consumption. I mean, if you've gotten 40, 50 miles per gallon already and you get 10% more, well, 10% of nothing is nothing. You're not really saving that much fuel. You're getting something like this. This is a full-size pickup truck with hybrid technology. If you can save 10% of the amount of fuel this puppy burns, then you're really getting somewhere. Plus, 
They sell hundreds of thousands of these things every year. If even 10% of those people can convert to a hybrid, then we're really going to save some liters of fuel. Now, people say this isn't a pure hybrid because it can't run on its electric power, which is true. But it does have regenerative braking, which saves a lot of energy. And it does have idle shutoff, which is the biggest saving of fuel in any hybrid. Plus, this is the first step. In a few years' time, General Motors will be evolving this technology to a pure hybrid. Now, that makes a lot of sense. The biggest problem with hybrids is still economics. This is expensive stuff, and you don't save enough fuel, even with the amount of fuel you're saving in this guy, to really pay for it. The government has to continue to work on rebate programs to lessen the initial hit, and I hate to say it, folks, they got to increase the price of fuel. I mean, it's still no more expensive than it was 20 years ago on an inflation-adjusted basis. If the price of gas doubles, you're going to see a lot of people jumping into hybrid pickup trucks. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, it's time to say goodbye to Shanghai, China, but before we go, we've got some good news and bad news. First, the bad news. From 1990 to 2002, China went from 5.5 million to 20 million vehicles, and it's estimated that figure will grow to 100 million by 2020. It's also predicted the number of cars on the roads around the world will have doubled to around 1.5 billion by 2020. So if the automobile is to remain the symbol of individual freedom as it has since the 50s, there is no alternative but to address what many consider a looming crisis. And now the good news, the auto industry is doing just that. I mean, today's modern vehicle is like a vacuum cleaner. It sucks in the dirty air and the air going out the tailpipe is cleaner. And we now have prototype vehicles that can travel over 100 kilometers on less than a liter of gasoline. And that is why the Michelin Challenge with Bendham is so important. It's showing the world that there is an alternative. We can have mobility, but with a clean car that respects the environment. And I know we all like to talk about having a clean environment, but you know what they say, talk is cheap. But in this case, too much talk could be fatal to the planet we live on. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. In this new car, they've addressed some of those ride and handling characteristics. They've tightened up the suspension. It may alienate some of the Buick buyers uh, that are used to that kind of marshmallowy, mushy, yucky ride. But in the long term, they have to go that way. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care. We do that. <laughs>